The 18th Amendment had converted us all to grateful outlaws. We did whatever we liked and we dressed in whatever we thought smart and broke rules for the sport of it, diving into public fountains, mixing social classes as casually as we mixed cocktails. There were no longer exclusive balls given for a few people with old money and good names, and even if there were, no one would have cared to go. Nice girls wore the kind of makeup that 30 years before would only have been seen on actresses, and actresses were escorted publicly by the scions of shipping fortunes, and some of them did not even bother to disguise their Bronx accents. Girls took to dressing like boys, and though women had obtained the vote, we had swiftly moved on to pursuing flashier freedoms, necking in cars, and smoking cigarettes, and walking down city streets in flesh-colored stockings. New York was the capital of commerce and joy, and young people sought us from every direction. They came in droves to join the kind of party only a great metropolis can host. They came from wealthy families and farming families, from the north and south and west. They came to avoid kitchens and marriages, to a place where they could reasonably claim to be 18 forever, or for the foreseeable future anyway, which seemed to us the same thing. They came mostly for the fun, especially the young things, especially the girls. I can't remember very many now, although there are three from that last incandescent summer whom I resist forgetting. They were all marching toward their own secret fates, and long before the next decade rolled around, each would escape in her own way. One would be famous, one would be married, and one would be dead. That is what I want to tell you about the girls with their short skirts and bright eyes and big city dreams, the girls of 1929.